Life has always been a challenge. When one has a problem and wishes to solve it, first one must determine what is the root cause of the problem. Simple problems have simple solutions. Complex problems are, well, more complex. An obvious problem with our current financial system is that it rewards greed and corruption. Greed and corruption seem to be everywhere. But are greed and corruption the root causes of the problem? Or are they the result of the way the system is built? Logically, one should first ask, are there built-in reasons why the system works the way it does? And if there are, can they be built out? Some say the basic reason the system is unstable and leads inevitably to corruption is the charging of interest. As explained earlier in this series, in our current bank credit as money system, the principal amount of a bank loan is simply created from the borrower's promise to pay back the principal plus interest in money. But the money to pay the interest is not created. The obvious but untrue conclusion is that it would therefore be mathematically impossible to pay off all debts. Many who call for money reform call for the abolition of interest as the solution to the problem. But is interest really the problem? Yes, there would be a serious mathematical shortage if all loans were concurrent and had to be paid back in one lump sum. That problem might apply to gangland loans and sometimes to farm loans, but that's not how the banking system works in general. Bank loans usually get paid back in a series of payments over a period of time, and for good reason. Money is both a stock, the amount in existence at any one time, and a flow, the transactions over time that the money is used for. Flow works like this. If I, the rich guy, lend you a dollar, and that was the only dollar in existence, the stock, could you pay me back a hundred dollars? Well, if it had to be paid in one lump sum, no. That other ninety-nine dollars, the interest on the loan, would be impossible to pay. It would be impossible to pay even in two dollar payments, because there is only one dollar in existence. But if I let you pay me the hundred dollars in one dollar payments, magic happens. In fact, in one dollar payments, you could pay me back any amount of interest if you lived long enough. The only condition required to make full payment of a hundred dollar debt with only one dollar in existence is that I give you the opportunity to earn or otherwise get that dollar back each time you pay it to me. This is the flow. And by means of the flow, the same dollar can be paid any number of times and becomes effectively many dollars, all legitimately representing the work done to earn them. It is always the work, the real value, that pays the debt and gives the dollar its value, not the dollar itself. The relationship in our example is dreadfully unequal because the man with the money has enslaved the man without it, just like the real world, some would say. But a simple loan at interest need not produce a shortage of money or cause unpayable debt if flow is 100%, as in our example. Flow is the real measure of economic activity. It's much more significant than the stock in a money system as it multiplies the effect of money in circulation. Given that today we use an exclusively debt money system, what is flowing in all these transactions is credit or promises to pay money. This credit is ultimately nothing more than the promises of borrowers to pay this credit back, usually according to a time schedule and usually with interest added. To pay this credit back, most of us will have to work and earn it by being productive. So, therefore, the real value of the money that flows in our economy today is created by our promises of future productive work. We take a loan in order to have something now rather than later. We agree to pay interest on into the future, thus reducing our future spending power, often by more than the amount of the original loan. 
However, with an understanding of flow, we see that there's no intractable arithmetic problem with the charging of interest. The problem is a social and systemic one. Lenders have neither obligation nor incentive to spend all their interest income so that the borrowers can earn it again and again. In fact, money lent once into existence is lent as existing money a second and a third time in expectation of more gain. The problem is basically one of incomplete recycling, where money needs to be spent, earned, and used to extinguish the debt that created it. It is instead lent or invested for gain. In other words, money that must be extinguished is instead expected to grow forever. Here's another simple example of a basic mechanism inherent to all lending. Let's say I lend you $100 and you spend it into circulation. It eventually ends up in the possession of someone who doesn't need to spend it and decides to lend it instead. Now once again, let's say this is the only $100 in existence, so you have to borrow it from the secondary lender in order to pay off your debt to me but now you have to borrow it from me to pay the secondary lender. This twice-lent money has become a perpetually unpayable debt. This debt can never be extinguished, nor even reduced without a default. Notice that interest doesn't even enter into this equation. The problem of perpetual debt remains interest or no. And even if the money itself is of intrinsic value, like gold or silver, or if it is issued by governments as cash, twice-lent money creates perpetual debt exactly the same way. When the same money is lent at interest, several times simultaneously, not only is the debt perpetual, Society as a whole is paying moneylenders multiples of the interest rate for the use of the same money. There's an expectation that existing money should increase indefinitely by being lent at interest. But this requires us to mentally divorce the money from the debt from which it came. However, the reality is, every dollar created today has a scheduled appointment to be extinguished as a principal payment on the loan that created it. And that's why debt money can't be separated from the debt that created it. It's like a yo-yo spun out into circulation in the economy for a while and then pulled back in at the appointed time. In order for the yo-yo to be free to return, all of the debt money needed to extinguish the debt has to be available to be earned. The flow must be complete. Can't we just pay off these debts with other money? But what would other money be? Today, the amount of physical cash and coin in circulation is very small. Almost all money is bank credit, debt money. So if almost all money comes into existence the same way, then it's valid to picture each debt money dollar as having its own cycle from creation to destruction. So the question, can we pay off debts with other money? No, there is no other money, as all of it is similarly committed to debt in one form or another. Therefore, the only way to ensure current payments can be made is to constantly increase the total amount of money in the system. But more money in a debt money system means more debt, so the debt hole in reality just deepens. Since debt is money in this system, it creates the fantasy of wealth for a while. But fantasies must come to an end. The day of reckoning can be pushed back but only by passing the debt onto generations yet unborn, which is precisely what we are doing now. Government debt piles up endlessly. Corporate debt piles up, consumer debt too. 
As long as total debt keeps increasing, the system can stay ahead of the debt monster. But all of this debt is an absurd fantasy that our descendants will surely never repay. Nor would they be advised to, as repayment of debt would eliminate the money stock and plunge the world into a depression. Once real growth levels off, due to the inherent limits of human productivity or the limited resources of a finite planet, this growth-dependent money system can only resolve its impossible arithmetic in a destruction of value. This can either happen through a deflationary spiral of credit defaults and falling prices, or by the devaluation of the money unit. Taken to extremes, either course of events will destroy an economy and even a civilization. The only other choice is debt forgiveness. In the ancient world, a regular debt jubilee, society-wide forgiveness of debts, was a common practice to deal with these unavoidable problems with lending. It was considered normal, even by the rich and powerful, that the general good of society took precedence over the rights of those rich enough to be lending money for profit.